Did you guys get saved the way I did but by the fact that it's a holiday week and so the traffic was like minimal this morning? I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> like, Thank you, universe. Okay. Um, so not only is it Thanksgiving week, but we are, we are rapidly approaching the end of the quarter. So this is our, um, let's see, after this we have two more classes, right? So, um, that means you've got one more in-class quiz, and unlike normal, it's going to be on Tuesday instead of Thursday, because then I'll be able to grade it and give it back to you before, you know, you go home and study for the final. Um, and so it's going to cover integers, and if we get around to uh, number theory stuff today, stuff on number theory, okay? Um, please, please, please start for the final exam. It is not too soon. The final exam is worth 30% of your grade. That's a pretty hefty chunk, so you don't want to treat this lightly, right? Um, this is not a good math class to delay until the last minute to start studying for it. You should start studying over your Thanksgiving break, right? So, like, read a little, eat a little, read a little, eat a little, right? Like, okay. Um, and so the way that you should be going through this is to, what I would recommend, right, is I've posted every single quiz that I've given you and every single handout that I've given you, um, and so one thing that you could do would be go print out the blank copies of the quizzes and just <coughs> try to do them without looking at your notes, right? And then you'll be able to like go back and score yourself because I've also posted the answer keys. And then that'll help you gauge like where you should direct your study time, right? To see where maybe some weaknesses lie and then you can more like laser focus your studying, okay? That will also tell you what questions you should bring to class next week so that we can start the review process, right? Um, so I'll set aside some time on Tuesday and Thursday for review, um, and so it would behoove you to come prepared for that, okay, next week. All right, are there any questions that you'd like to ask right now? Yes. Oh, um, for your gift of numbers packets, put the um, original proposal, revised proposal, reflection. And if you've already stapled it, don't pull it apart. <laughs> okay. So, original, revised, reflection. I only had two people ask me to look over their drafts, so um, hopefully you guys thought about it carefully and took to heart the things that I shared with you in class. Um, yeah, so I'll be busy grading those over the break. Hopefully I'll get through them all in time to give them back to you next week. Um, but if not, I will certainly have them back to you by the day of the final at the latest, right? Okay, um, any other questions? Question? No? I do not. But I think some of your classmates might. If somebody if somebody is so kind. I think they got it. Cool. That was oh my gosh, I downloaded the New York Times crossword app and I'm losing my mind. I've done so many crosswords, and this morning one of the ones was like an item on a teacher's desk, and it's like a stapler, even though I don't have one, but it worked, it fit, I was so excited. Okay, um, all right, the little things in life, guys. Um, so last time we started uh, talking about integers in chapter 10, you remember? Good handout. And so in particular, we started out by looking at three different ways that you could conceptualize of signed numbers. So in particular, starting out, thinking about building from what we already have. So leading into the introduction of signed numbers, students will already have 
dealt with positive numbers, and so you could think about n negative numbers as opposites in terms of a reflection across zero. And then you could think about signed numbers as additive inverses, so namely the things that you would add to something else to get back to zero. Um, and then as directed changes, where you're thinking about um, positive numbers as an amount of change to the right, starting from anywhere on the number line, and then negative numbers as a change to the left, starting from anywhere on the number line. Right? And so I could think about, for instance, negative 2, um, not just as the change from 0 to negative 2 on the number line, but also from like negative 4 to negative 6, for instance. Right? And hopefully that makes sense if you, so I didn't necessarily talk about the um, uh, conventions, if you will, of using these arrows on a number line, but you could imagine an arrow sort of implies directionality, in particular a starting place and an ending place. And if you, if you think about what we've already discussed in class in terms of the different arithmetic operations, you can capture the amount of change using subtraction, right? So subtraction is the operation that I would use to capture an, um, like a difference, right, between ending value and starting value. So in particular, negative 6 minus negative 4, right, should equal negative 2 by observation, right? So if I start at negative 4, and I end at negative 6, that requires a move two units to the left, which we're encoding with a negative 2. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so that's review from last class. Then, do you remember what we did after that? We started looking at how kids reason about sign numbers when they've never been taught them before, right? And so um, we talked about how you could think about starting point plus or minus some change gives you ending over there, only changed. So if I have my starting point at negative 4 plus some amount of change is equal to negative 6, well, then this has to be a negative 2, right? So this is where I'm thinking about the change, change, still starting, still ending, right? It's just a rearrangement. It's basically a new family, right? Which, by the way, in one of the drafts that I read for Gift of Numbers, I was really excited because somebody took the idea of a fact family with addition and subtraction, and generalized it to multiplication and division, and I just lost my mind. I thought it was so cool. It was really neat. So, okay. Um, all right. And so we talked about how you could use that way of thinking. But what was tricky about something like this, of course, was that if you don't already know what the starting value is, then making a change of 5 to land somewhere is kind of tricky. And so you actually are basically left doing a guess and check, like where do, where do I have to start and then move 5 to the right from that point to get to negative 2. The only way to really do that is through guess and check. Okay. Okay. I'm going to skip this one. So another strategy that kids use um, when first acquainting themselves with signed numbers is to treat negative numbers as if they were positive numbers and then slap a negative sign on at the end, right? Um, I believe, did we watch the video of Jacob? I think it was Jacob doing this. Yeah. So um, I think his example was negative 5 plus negative 2 is negative 7, and the way he did it was by saying 5 plus 2 is 7, so we just throw a negative on. So my question to you is, will that always work? In particular, if I gave you all of these problems, would his strategy work for negative 9 minus negative 2? 
What is negative 9 minus negative 2? Negative 7. Why doesn't that work? But what's his, but what's his strategy? Do the equation as if it were positive numbers. So that means he would be doing 9 minus 2, which is 7. And then he threw a negative. So did it work? It worked. What about blank plus negative 6 equals negative 10? What would Jacob do? What would his strategy be? He would say blank plus 6 is equal to 10. So what goes in the blank here? A 4. So what is he going to write here? Negative 4. Do you see what's happening? Okay. Three, negative 3 plus negative 8 equals blank. Jacob would say 3 plus 8 equals 11. So this is negative 11. What about here? What would Jacob do? Eight minus blank equals three. So what goes in the blank? Five. So what goes in this blank? Negative five. Does that work? Yeah, right? Okay, but what about down here? What would Jacob do? He would say three plus five is equal to blank, right? What goes in the blank? Eight. So he would write negative eight. Is that correct? Oh, darn. So what, what causes this strategy to fail? When there's a mixture of positive and negative numbers in the equation, right? So his strategy works beautifully as long as all of the numbers are negative or all of the numbers are positive. Why is that? When we slap on a negative, what are we really doing? Hmm? Okay, so the, when we put a negative on a number, that's pushing it to the opposite side of zero. Absolutely. Let me rephrase the question. Is there a way to write down like a mathematical operation that's equivalent to me, like, writing a negative in front of something. <clears throat> in other words, if I write this number and I want to put a negative in front of this, what is that mathematically equivalent to doing? Am I adding a negative? I'm multiplying by negative 1, right? So let's think about, say, this equation. 9 minus 2 equals 7. Or let me do one with addition just to really, like, highlight my point because I think that will be more familiar. So 6 equals 7, and I want to slap the negative on to everything, right? Which means I need to multiply everything by negative 1. So if I take 4 plus 6 equals 10, and I multiply the left-hand side by negative 1, and I multiply the right-hand side by negative 1, have I changed my equation, like the, the essence of my equation? No, right? Because I multiplied by the same number on both sides, right? So if I multiply by the same number on both sides, then I haven't changed the relationship that I'm expressing, okay? What property could I use here? I could distribute the negative 1, so I have negative 4 plus negative 6 is equal to negative 10. Huh. That's why it works. Right? Because you are allowed to multiply both sides of an equation by negative 1. And when you do that, you have to distribute the negative across the sum or the difference, whatever it may be. And so what goes wrong down here is the fact that if I were to slap on the negative, right, on the left-hand side of 3 plus negative 5, 
When I distribute the negative, I'd end up with a negative 3 plus positive 5, right? Now we're, we're messing with things, <laughs> okay? So the strategy fails there. We need to do something else. Okay, how are we doing? So this is something that you should expect to encounter, right? Like, it's a solid strategy, and if, like, the only examples that you've chosen to do in class are adding one negative number to another negative number, it's not surprising that a student would develop this thought process, right? And so this points to the need for you to be, like, really thoughtful about the examples that you choose. Like, if you're teaching kids how to add negative numbers, that at some point, rather than just having them add two negative numbers, you make sure that you mix them. Okay? Because otherwise they might um, accidentally develop some sort of misconception, which is reasonable, but still not what we want. Okay. Can I erase? Okay. So then... There's um, a third way that kids will reason about signed numbers, which is first to determine like whether or not the missing value should be positive or negative, and then figure out how big the number should be. Okay? And so in particular, when you look at something like 8 minus blank equals 13, well, 8 is smaller than 13, and we're subtracting. So the only way to subtract something from 8 and get something bigger is for the something to be negative. And so now I just need to figure out, like, what negative number goes in here. And so I can say, oh, okay, so from 8 to 13 is 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So negative 5. Did that process make sense? Can somebody help me do it for 10 plus blank equals 7? What would the logic sound like here? Nathaniel? Yeah, that was beautifully said. Did everybody get it? 10 is bigger than 7, but we're adding. So the only way to add something to 10 and get a smaller number is if the something is negative. So this will be a negative number. Now let's figure out what the number should be. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 3, negative 3. Okay. Should we do one more or are we good? One more. Okay, so negative 8 minus blank equals 4. Can I get a different volunteer? Talk it through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I subtract some, a positive number from a negative number, am I making this number bigger or smaller? In other, word, in other words, am I moving to the right on the number line or to the left on the number line? To the left. Yeah. So if this is a positive number, I'm going to move to the left. But where is 4 on the number line? To the right. No, you're fine. It's okay. We, this is why we practice. Right? This is our safe space to practice. You guys know that, right? Like, I don't need you to have the right answer on the first try every time. If you did, you wouldn't need to be in the class. Right? Like, that's why we have the class. Do you get it? 
Good. <laughs> I hope you've gotten that message by now, but maybe not. I love that you volunteered. Thank you. But let's polish it up again, right? Do you want to try again? Or should we let somebody else try? Okay. Would somebody else like to help out? You want to try again? So you need to subtract a negative number that's bigger, that's more negative than negative. Okay. Yeah. So by subtracting negative 12, that would be your positive 4. Okay. So, right, the issue is from negative 8, we're subtracting something to get 4. But 4 is bigger than negative 8. So the only way to subtract a number from something and get something bigger is if the thing you're adding is negative, right? But then you have to figure out how big the something is. So how do you do that? Well, you count. You count from negative 8 up to 4. So negative 12. How did you know in your head that it was 12? Okay. Okay, so again, the point of this class is not to get you to fill in the blank. I know you can fill in the blank, right? The point of the class is to get you to explain different ways to fill in the blank, okay? So the whole purpose of this class is getting you guys to grapple with, I know how to get the answer, now how do I help somebody else get the answer, right? That's the point of the class. So just being able to fill in the blank is insufficient. You must be able to explain how. What I'm doing here is trying to show you, at this point now, this is the third way that you might reason about filling in the blank. Does everybody see that? We've just covered three different ways to think about how to do this. Okay. Now, why would somebody want to do this? <laughs> right? That might be a question you're asking yourself. Um, and the idea is very simple, right? Like, again, do you remember the whole vision of this class? There was like a story that I told at the beginning that I've been filling in the blanks as we go where we said, ah, mathematics is this beautiful language that allows us to solve problems in the real world once we quantify situations, right? So once I've analyzed the situation and identified quantities and how they're related to each other, then I can actually do something with them. I can analyze them and work with them. But the things that I'm analyzing and working with end up having values. Those values take the form of numbers. And there's lots of different kinds of numbers. And so this whole quarter has been a journey through numbers, right? So we started with whole numbers, and then we looked at really big numbers, and we looked at decimal numbers and fractions and percentages and scientific notation, and now integers, right? So it's been a journey through numbers. But all with the goal of being able to analyze situations and make meaning out of those situations. <clears throat> so I've made a list of a whole bunch of scenarios in which you might use signed numbers very naturally, okay? Um, so we've got financial matters like bank balances, profit loss, paychecks, bills, income debt, credit cards, and so on. Temperature changes, sea level, sports settings like football and golf, dieting, um, games in which you can go in the hole. So what I'd like you guys to do is take maybe four minutes. Um, so you guys will do number one. You guys will do number two. You guys will do three. 
You guys will do, do you know sports? Football, golf? Yes. I've got one at this table. Do more of you know football, golf? I feel like this is terribly stereotypical. Katie, do you know, do you know football, golf? Yeah. Okay. We'll give you guys that one. And then you guys can take the diets. And then you guys will take games where you can go in the hole. Can you think of a game where you go in the hole? Where you, like, owe money or something? Or loot? Like, you can get negative points? Try to come up with them. Okay. And so for each of the scenarios, here's what I want you to do. For each of the scenarios, you should be able to tell me if I have a value of zero, what does that mean? If I have a value of, say, positive 10, what would that mean? If I have a value of, say, negative 5, what would that mean? Okay, so that's your task. Take a couple minutes to do that at your tables. So you're right. You're both right. Right? It depends on the scenario. Like the scenario. So pick one scenario <clears throat> and then tell me the meaning for zero, negative 10, and positive 5, or whatever I said. Okay? Um, and then try to help your classmates think about when you would see which one. Right? So for instance, I could imagine seeing... Do people do this anymore? <laughs> balance your checkbook, <laughs> or at least like when you, <laughs> oh, I'm so old. Um, okay, so at least on your bank, like when you log in online and you look at your bank stuff, like you have your account balance, and then you have like the whole list of transactions, right, and it'll be like black if you deposited something, and like red if you withdrew something. So instead of putting a negative number in front, they just color code mm -hmm. things, right? But essentially, that's what they're doing, right? They're saying, like, here's a positive amount towards your balance, and here's a negative amount towards your balance. And then, like, when you go through, like, all of those changes, then you end up with, like, here's what, here's what your actual balance is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So Nobody balance. So you should so you should write you should be able to tell me like here's the scenario I'm looking at my balance uh, to, uh, bank records. I'm looking at like your monthly expense. Oh yeah, yeah, but we're writing out that. Positive ten and negative five mean. Okay. How are you guys doing? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Don't see that often in Southern California. Yeah. Okay. But, um, okay, so here's my question for you. Do you, hmm, when I think about, like, the number uh, positive 10 in this setting, do I have to be thinking about, say, 10 degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit? Like, is it necessary that I be thinking that way? Or is there a different scenario in which you could envision having temperatures stuff <laughs> where positive 10 would be significant in some way? Well, like 10 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as 10 degrees Celsius. 
those are different. So I think you would have to think of it like one way or another because then like the numbers would be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a weather app on my phone. Let's bust it out for a second. Mm, where did I? Oh no, I just organized. Oh, here we go. And I forgot where I put everything. Okay, so it says right now is 69 degrees at 5. At 9 a.m., it's going to be 74 degrees. How much does the temperature increase between now and 9 a.m.? Five degrees. Okay. Between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., the temperature goes from 74 to 79. What's the change in temperature between 9 and 10? Also a positive five-degree change, right? Now... When the sun sets around 5, the temperature goes from 79 to 76. What is the change in temperature from 5 to 6 p.m.? Negative 3 degrees. So even the, right, yeah, <laughs> cool, right? So even though the temperatures are in the 70s, the change in temperature can be negative. So if you have a change in temperature of 0 degrees, that just means the temperature stayed the same. If you have a change in temperature of positive 10 degrees, that means it got hotter by 10 degrees. And if you have a change of negative 5 degrees, that means it got cooler. Right? Makes sense? But you were absolutely right with your first thinking, right? So what I'm, just, what I'm just trying to point out is that there are two ways to think about temperatures with signed numbers. One is as the actual temperature, but the other is as temperature changes. Do you feel like you can explain that to the class? Yeah. Thank you. How are you guys doing the sea level? So we thought that above sea level would be positive, mm -hmm. below sea level would be negative, mm -hmm. and sea level was like in zero. And we thought that as a number line, so Beautiful. Would be the level, and then above would be a positive and below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I gave you the number positive 10 in this context, what would that mean? is usually, I think, what they use. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, ladies. All right. What did you guys come up with? You had, what, diets? Diets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in this case, um... <laughs> Numbers, weight, I like that. So, can your weight be negative? No, no but your weight loss can be. Okay, so yeah, so when you say numbers, like to me that means like all numbers, all numbers in the universe, which I don't think is what you meant, right? So, but your weight could be some non negative value. We'll just say positive value. You never weigh zero pounds, right? <laughs> okay, so your weight is some positive value. Um, but what's really interesting is if I told you, like the number positive five in this context, what is that most likely to mean? Gained. That you gained five pounds, hopefully of muscle, right? Okay, and then, if you, and then if you said like negative three, what is that gonna mean in this context? You lost three pounds, right? Okay. So this would be numbers that would be positive? I, I just, honestly, I wouldn't even address it. I would say, I would talk about weight gain and weight loss. And so basically you could go from like 150 to 155 pounds. The change in your weight is positive 5. But then you could go from 155 to 152. The change in your weight is negative 3. Right? How are you guys doing? Which sport did you pick? Okay. Golf is like the supernatural one because yeah. they literally use positive yeah. and negative numbers yeah. in the scoreboard, right? Yeah. Are you prepared to explain how the scoreboard works to the class? You've seen like the, the it goes like this, right? Or sometimes it's vertically, right? But then for like each hole, what do you write down in your scorecard? Like, if it was a three-par hole and you got it in three strokes, what would you put? You'd put a zero. If it was a three-par hole and you hit it in four strokes, what would you put? Plus one. If you got a, what's a birdie? A negative one, right? Okay. So the number you record is not the same as the number of... Right. Yeah? 
The football one. Yards gained, yards lost. I agree, but the thing that's funky about the football one is that the zero changes, like in turn, right? In ter like, because the line of scrimmage moves. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which one did I give you guys? Game. Oh, games. Did you come up with a game? Um, or remember a game or something? Would you come? No. The no? only thing I saw was there was one game called Payday where you can take out loans. Oh, nice. <laughs> so okay. That's right there is a big. Thing. So you could go on the hole. Yeah. And then your goal would be to get back to zero. Mm -hmm. So if you're in negative 10, you would want everything to be positive. <laughs> Hopefully. To work your way closer to zero. Hopefully beyond. Right. Right. Then you'd be safe. Yeah, I was trying to, um, I always spaz on this particular class day of trying to remember a game where you like. Well, she had a scratcher idea. What's the scratcher oh. idea? No, um, well, Rebecca just mentioned that if you buy a scratcher. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you have like the $20 and then you can always do work even or if you lose your money, you don't win anything, or if you actually won $5, then you went like up $3. I like that. And so what is the quantity that's changing in, the, in all of those examples? How about the amount of money you have, <laughs> right? Like when you buy, that changes by negative two, right? When you win, hopefully it changes by like positive 100,000, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea? But the quantity that you're looking at is the amount of money you, you have, and then the corresponding changes in that amount of money. Yeah? Okay. Because you don't actually have negative $2 when you buy it, right? You still, hopefully, you still have some money in your pocket, right? Like, or zero. If you've got a problem, right? Then, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to talk as a class. So, um,. Would my lovely ladies to the left, please, talk to us about financial matters. So tell us, what's the financial setting that you were thinking about? And then tell us what the meaning of zero and a positive number and a negative number would be. So you had like an auto payment yeah. that deducted. If you don't notice before ACM, you're going to get that uh, $35 overdraft fee too. Oh no. Really well. Okay, so these are like charges here, Love and then you have like balance here. Oh, <laughs> thanks, mom. Our mom says 10. Yeah, luckily our mom got $10 in her purse, but she gave it to us. Okay. And deposited. And no overdraft fee. Hallelujah. Okay, here's a question to the class. Okay, so in this particular example, the meaning of zero is what? This is to the class. In their example, what is the meaning of this zero? There's zero dollars in the bank, right? What is the meaning of this negative five? So this was, this was the amount deducted from the account, which is actually a slightly different meaning than this negative five dollars. Because what is this negative five representing? The new account balance, right? What does this positive ten represent? How much you deposit into the bank, right? And what does this positive five represent? Your new account balance. So notice these, like this second column of numbers has a, di like they mean something different than this first column. Hence why I put labels, right? So this is one of the things where like modern technology is actually kind of hurting us. In the old days, we had checkbooks <laughs> where you would like write down on this date at this store, I spent this much, and then you'd have to like, 
subtract that number from your running total, right? You just, I know. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So your bank does it for you. That's nice. It displays that for you. That's really good. Um, okay. Here's my new question. Do or um, must we put ourselves in a situation where our bank balance is zero to be able to talk about the number zero in this setting? No, right? In particular, what could happen? So you could be, say, talking about your net worth, which is, you know, when you take into account all of your debts, but all of your assets as well. So, like, if you have a house, you have a car that's paid off, but then you went and bought a second car that's not paid off, right? Okay? So, like, when you take all of those things into account, and, like, how much money is in your checking account, and how much money is in your retirement account, all of that together is your net worth, financially speaking. <laughs> you are worth more than your checking account, okay? Um, but you could, for instance, make a transaction with somebody where it's an even exchange. In which case, at the end of that even exchange, how much has your net worth changed? By zero, right? So it is possible to talk. So basically, if you're talking about a change in value, financially speaking, um, that has like a, a no net change, that would be a meaning of zero. And then a net change that's positive would be an increase in value. A net change that's negative would be a decrease in value. Okay? All right. We also talked about temperature changes. So ladies, please talk to me about temperature. Or talk to the class about temperature. Stand over here. Maybe she'll talk to you. Temperature. So, um, so we can think of it as like 72 degrees or negative 2 degrees, depending on you know, where you're at. Is everybody cool with that? So it's positive 72 degrees in Southern California today. It's negative 2 degrees in Anchorage, Alaska. Somewhere, probably not that cold, but you get the idea. Yeah? Okay. Does that make sense? So when you talk about positive and negative numbers with temperatures, you don't just have to be talking about the temperature. You can talk about how the temperature changes. And one of the fun things about living in a desert is we have fairly extreme temperature changes, right? Like you can start out at 50 degrees this morning, and then it'll be like 97 degrees on Wednesday at noon or 1 o'clock or whenever the peak heat of the day is, right? And it'll drop back down to like 57, <laughs> right? Okay, and so that increase in temperature corresponds to positive values, and the decrease in temperature corresponds to negative values. Okay, um, sea levels. Talk to us, ladies. Talk to the class. Just keep standing over here, so maybe you'll talk to the class. So with that way of thinking, guys, if I tell you the number positive three, what does that mean to you? Say it loud and proud, Tracy. Three feet above sea level. Three feet above sea level. And if I say negative five, what does that mean? Five feet below sea level. So you're hoping there's some high land around you because otherwise you're underwater, right? Make sense? Okay. Dieting. Please talk to us about that.
five pounds. That means they went up positive. Oh, sorry. That means they went up to positive five pounds. Okay. So from 130 to 135 pounds. And then next time they weigh themselves, they're 125 pounds. So then they lost five pounds to be negative five. Oh wait, from 130, not from the 135. Oh, you're right. So never mind. It's 130 because they lost five pounds. Okay. From 135. Oh, okay. So if we say somebody went from 100 to 135, that's a change in weight of positive five pounds. So they gained weight. And if I say, okay, now the person has a change in weight of negative five pounds, what does that mean? They lost weight. What's the net change in weight in that scenario? So when you say a net change, it means the overall effect. So from start to finish, what was the, what happened? So they started by gaining five pounds and then they lost five pounds. So the net change was zero pounds. Yeah? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So this is probably what we'll all do this week with eating turkey and then going to the gym. Okay. All right. Talk to us about golf. Shamara, you want to break some stereotypes? Can you do it? Well, okay. <laughs> golf, the point, because the point is to get the ball into the hole with as few strokes as possible. Everybody understand that's the point of golf? Yeah? Okay. It doesn't want to take you, like, a lot of time to hit the ball to get it in the hole. So, right. Um, okay, so if it's three. Or three. If it's yeah. three. I mean, the standard stroke is three. Stroke for the for the hole, and if you play four stroke, I mean you have plus one for the hole, and if you play three stroke, I mean uh, you have a negative one for the hole. You said it was a par three. Yeah. And you take oh, three strokes. Yeah, I mean two two strokes. Oh, okay. So so okay. So the way that they do scoring in golf, right, is like each hole has a par number. And that's how many strokes you expect it to take to get from the tee to the hole. So par three hole, you'd expect to take three strokes to get from start to finish. <laughs> yeah? Okay. And if you're a good golfer, maybe you'll do it in less. So you might only take two strokes to get to the hole. In which case, on your scorecard, you wouldn't write the number two. You would actually write the number negative one because it took you one fewer stroke than you expected it to, okay? Um, but if you're like still pretty good, but not pro level, then maybe it took you three strokes. So you, you were at par, right? And so instead of writing the number three on your scorecard, you'd write the number zero. But if you're like me, <laughs> then it might have taken you like eight strokes, <laughs> in which case, You'd write plus five on your scorecard, right? Okay. And so when you see, like, the leaderboard for golf tournaments, it'll be, like, the, the leader will be, like, negative 12, and then the next one will be negative 11, and then negative 10, and negative 9, right? So that's, yeah. So now if you ever want to go watch golf, now you know what's going on. Okay. Here we go. Um, what was the last one? Games in which you can go into the hole. You want to do the scratcher?
Oh, that was fast. Okay, so can we slow it down? Yeah. Okay, so you start with how much money? $5. Okay, and then you spent $2. So that's a change in the amount of money that you have of negative $2. It's not saying you have negative $2. It's saying you spent $2, right? So the change, okay, but this is important because I see this issue all the time whenever I have you guys actually write this stuff down. So when we, so the English language encodes negatives naturally, right? So you don't say you spent negative $2, right? We don't talk that way. You say that you spent $2. But the change in your, like, wallet <laughs> value is negative 2, right? So when we use this generic word, change, that doesn't encode an increase or decrease. So you have to use a signed number, right? But if you use a word like spent, that already encodes the positive negative. Just like over here when we were talking about diets, you gain or lose, that tells you whether or not your weight is increasing or decreasing. Yeah? But then if you say change in weight, now you don't know if that, direct, if that change was a gain or a loss. So this is, where you, this is the type of language where you would need to use a signed number. Does that make sense? Language matters. <laughs> right. Okay. Yes, question. So if I ask you to give me a word problem where you need to use signed numbers, then if you told me that somebody gained five pounds and then lost seven pounds, I would not give you points because there's no need to use negative numbers there. You just use subtraction and addition, right? Does that make sense? You, want to use you would need to use change, the language of change, to require positive and negative numbers. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Now, when I, if I asked you what is the meaning of negative 5 in this context, then, you, then that's when you would tell me, oh, they lost 5 pounds. Okay? So when I ask you for the meaning, that's when you can go back to using our normal English language way of saying things. Okay? Cool? Cool. All right. Now, where are we at? Oh, bye, Rebecca. Okay, that's weird. Class has been from 8 to 10 for the whole quarter, but okay. Um, all right, so you guys like to play with things? Like with your hands? That's better, right? So let's play with things. Okay, so so far we've talked about how to think about signed numbers. We've talked about different models for... Um, Real world scenarios where you would be able to talk about, you know, using signed numbers. But if we still are curious about how to support kids in developing their, like, arithmetic skills when it comes to signed numbers, then we can use manipulatives, okay? So besides number lines, by the way, we already have established one manipulative. That's the number line. It's a really good one. Okay. But, and you saw kids using number lines in the videos. Yeah? Okay. But if you want them to have something to touch and feel and play with, then you can use these chips. Colored chips. So here's the rules with the chips. Because you need to lay some ground rules. You guys have red and yellow or red and white, and just because I 
was too lazy to draw my own pictures, I have uh, black and blue <laughs> and my slides. Sorry. Okay. So the red and black, what would you like that to represent? Positive or negative? negative. You want that to be negative? Okay. So these are going to correspond to negative numbers. In particular, one red or one black chip represents the number or the value of negative one. So I'm actually going to write negative one, not just negative. Okay? So one, one, one chip in one of these colors it means negative one. And then one chip in yellow, white, or blue <laughs> Good Lord. corresponds to positive one. Yeah? Okay. And here's the other rule. To flip the chips once you've put them down. Okay? So what do I mean by that? I mean if you have a, a chip facing red up and you want to you want to multiply by something, you're not allowed to just go like this. <laughs> okay? This is not allowed. So the only way to manipulate the chips, and in particular, the value that you're representing, is by either adding more or taking some away. Okay? So far so good? Okay, so now your task is to represent the number two using your chips. Really fast. We're just going to get familiar. We're going to warm up. So represent the number positive two. Where's your two? Red is negative. Two. Two. Okay, so I see everybody has two. Now, I want you to represent the number negative three. Negative three. If you want. Is it possible to do that? Yes. Oh, you guys are making me so happy right now. So happy. Oh, so cool. So cool. Okay. So here's your challenge. All of you have one way of representing the number negative three. Give me a second way. So using new chips, leave out the one you are, ones you already have. Now use different chips to also show me negative three. Come up with another way. Yes. Yes. Perfect. What do you guys have? Ah, brilliant. Okay, so everybody came up with a way. This is beautiful. Why does your way work? So some of the ways that I've seen. Here's how I'm. Here's how I'm going to code things. Um, I'll do this for a positive one, and this for a negative one. Yeah. Okay, so in order to draw a negative 3 right here, I'm looking at 5 negatives and 2 positives. So why does that represent negative 3? That's what we're trying to, trying to help kids understand. Okay, so let's, okay, sorry, maybe I didn't, I did not set this up well. The goal right now is to play with manipulatives in a way 
where we're trying to help kids develop an understanding of how to add and subtract positive and negative numbers, besides just using a number line, right? So rather than having them like look at a number line and move three units to the left from zero, now I want to be like, all right, let's think about this a different way. So yeah. Uh huh. Well, what does that mean? What does cancel mean? Positive. Ah, there we go. I knew we'd get there. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear that? So positive one and negative one combine to make zero. Why? What do we call that? Additive inverses. Yeah? So positive one and negative one are additive inverses of each other. And so when you pair them up, they add to zero. And when you add zero to anything, what do you get? The anything, right? What is that property? Zero plus something equals something? That's the... Additive identity property. Zero is the additive identity. It's all coming together, yeah? Okay, so that means zero plus zero plus negative three is negative three. You draw an arrow, okay? So far so good? That was magical. That was a magical moment for me. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead because we just did this out loud and you guys already showed me. Here's a bunch of different ways to represent zero, right? Pair, basically having pairs of positives and negatives together. Here are some other ways of representing negative three. Um, okay, we don't need to do this. Okay, what is B representing? Negative one. What does C represent? Negative three. What does E represent? Positive one. And what does F represent? <laughs> these, 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 positive one, right? Okay. So if you had all of those laid out in your hand, what you would be able to do would be able to like slide them together and be like, okay, take that away, you can take that away, you can take that away, right? Take that away, and I'm left with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I try to make this stuff relevant. <laughs> I promise I'm not torturing you. <laughs> okay, so now the question becomes, right, again, we're trying to help kids understand how to operate with signed numbers. So if I want to add signed numbers, well, we kind of already saw how it works, right? But let's just, let's just do something. So I want you guys to add, okay, well, here's the boring example, right? If they're all the same value, so adding positive 3 to positive 2, and, like, if you take your, your things, right, you're going to, like, pull out three yellows or whites, and then two yellows or whites, and then you're going to smash them together and be like, oh, I have five yellows or whites. <laughs> right? And then if they're all negatives, then you can do the same thing. You just pull out all of your black or blue chips and do it that way. But then, what happens? So if I wanted to combine opposite signed numbers, I might end up with a diagram like this. So one of the things that I would like to point out to you right now is you have in front of you chips that you can play with and move. And what, I wanted, what I'm interested in is whether or not you are able to use these manipulatives effectively to support somebody else in reasoning about signed numbers which means I need a way for you guys to be able to draw pictures of what you're doing so that I can tell that you know how to do it. Does that make sense? So here is a way to capture what we are doing with these manipulatives, is to draw a box as if it was the table that's in front of you, and then put the chips out the way that you want them to start with. 
right? So in the box on the left-hand side, if I told you that we are doing an addition problem, what addition problem is being captured on the left, inside of the left box? So the blues are positive one. So we have three, right? So this is my three plus negative five. And then I would go a little further than what the book does because I feel like it was just sort of magical how you got from here to here. This would be to show three plus negative five, right? And then something has to happen. On arrow to say, okay, then I do stuff, <laughs> and here's what I get after I do the stuff. And you're trying to communicate with me, and I'm not in your brain. You need to tell me what you did with the arrow. So you're going to combine pairs of positive one and negative one to make zero. Right? And then when you do that, what you're left with is just negative 2. Okay? So that means, so this whole thing captures what number sentence? So overall, this diagram shows that negative, sorry, Positive 3 plus negative 5 is equal to negative 2. Is that okay? All right. What would negative 2 plus 4 look like? Draw the diagram to capture what you're doing with the chips. So negative 2 plus positive 4. So what would negative 2 plus positive 4 look like? If you're not expecting an emergency call, could you please put that away? Thank you. What's your diagram? Beautiful. Okay. Too challenging. So positive, no, what did I say? Negative two. Negative two plus positive four. Looks something like this. And then after you do some manipulation, what's the manipulation that you're going to do? We're going to combine pairs, right? Of positive one and negative one to make zero, and that leaves us with what? Positive two. So this captures the fact that negative two plus positive four is equal to positive two. Now, I wrote the little positive superscript thingy just for added emphasis, but I'm totally okay with you leaving that off, right? Sometimes they use these when you're first introducing signed numbers to help, to help kids see the difference, right? Um, so don't be surprised if you're teaching the fourth or fifth grade. I forget, I forget the grade level right now, um, and you start seeing these. Say that again? Mm. To use parentheses. Yeah, so some people 
we'll say if you want to do 3 plus negative 5, that you should put parentheses around negative numbers. I have no personal preference. I don't know that there's a super... I'm not aware of an advantage for that. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's why I could see that happening. I just realized. Because kids don't write as carefully as grown-ups, although sometimes grown-ups don't write very carefully either. Um, but so one thing that you notice that I've been doing, right, is I've been superscripting the plus or the minus. But a lot of times you don't, right? Like you, it's equally valid. So I could, for instance, say like 2 minus negative 5. This looks horrible to me. This just like makes me want to cry, right? This is not pretty mathematics notation. So in particular, so when you don't superscript the negative, and you're pairing it next to an operation, it looks like you're subtracting twice, which is bleh, right? You don't do that. Operations require numbers on either side or some sort of quantity. So that you would definitely, definitely want to have parentheses. OK? Good question. I'm glad we thought through that. <laughs> OK. OK, so addition, not so hard, right? Addition's like chill, yeah? Okay. But um, subtraction, subtraction is a little bit trickier. So we'll start with the baby example. So subtraction doesn't have to be tricky. For instance, if you do 4 minus 3, right, you start with four positive chips. And then inherently, when you're using a chip model, you're automatically thinking about subtraction as takeaway subtraction, right? Like you start with four chips, you take away three, <laughs> and how many are left? Oh, one. Cool, right? But here's the thing. Or, and likewise, so here's another example. So if I start with five negative one chips, so five black chips, and I take away two black chips, so I'm going to circle them and take them away, right? So if I was diagramming this for, you know, a quiz or something, then I would diagram that, and then I would draw my little arrow taking away. So take away two, maybe two, negative one chips. And that leaves you with the three negative one chips. So we've now modeled that number sentence, right? OK, so this was easy. Why? Because in, in both cases, like here, I had three positive chips to take away, right? And here, I had two negative chips to take away. But what if I mess with it? What if I say do positive 5 minus negative 2? So now do positive 5 minus negative 2. So how, how do we tackle this using chips? Because remember, you're not allowed to flip them over. No flipping. It's against the rules. So again, your task is you start with 5, positive 5, and somehow you need to be able to take away a negative 2. So try to figure that out at your tables for a second. And while you do, I'm going to pull up a, a thing for you. I have to remember what it is, national.
Oh, this is so sad. So I was going to pull up the manipulative thing that I told you about, right? But look, I have the rainbow wheel of death. It won't load. This is so sad. Okay, well, so... <sighs> tragic. Okay, but you remember that website, that, this website that I showed you guys that has all the cool, like, virtual manipulatives? So if you like playing with the color chips and you want to practice more... If you go to the numbers and operations, this is the list. And so you can do color chips for addition, and you can do color chips for subtraction, and it'll walk you through everything that we're about to do. Okay? So if, if we do this and it feels too fast and you want more practice or you just want more practice and you want to play with it but you don't have colorful chips, then you can go online. Right? I posted the link on, on Blackboard. Okay? Um, I'm really sorry I can't model it because it was it was going to be fabulous. I was so jazzed. Maybe we'll just leave it up in the background and I'll use the white space temporarily. <laughs> okay. So, um, so did you come up with something? What can we do? So we have positive five minus negative two, and the issue right now is that I'm starting. We have five positive one chips, right? But I want to be able to remove two negative one chips. And I don't have any. So what do I do? I can do what? Add two positives? Just two positive chips? If I add two positive chips, then I'm changing the value of my number, right? So I don't want to, like, change the problem. I still want to do this problem. But I need something to work with. <coughs> what is it that I need? I need the two negative chips. But if I were to put two negative chips in here, if I don't want to change what I'm doing, then what else do I have to add? Two positive chips is positive 5. Everybody agree? But so is that. Right? So what did we do? We add a fancy 0. <laughs> right? So this is still still positive 5 but expressed as positive 7 plus negative 2. Yeah? Now, can we take away two negative 1 chips? You betcha, right? So now I can grab these guys and take away Negative 2. And when I do that, what remains? Positive 7. Right? And so this diagram now captures how positive 5 minus negative 2 is equal to positive 7. Pretty cool? Yeah? I am very disappointed in my computer right now. I really wanted to show you that. 
It's really cool. Can you please check it out? Like, you'll be rewarded. <laughs> right? Like, it, it's neat. It really works. Okay. Um, so I had other examples. Can I erase? Yeah. I'm not hearing a no, so I'm going to do it. Okay. So here's another example. 2, positive 2 minus negative 3 equals something. So we start out by thinking to ourselves, all right, well, 2 minus negative 3 is really, like, I could rewrite the 2 as 2 plus 0, yeah? And then take away negative 3. So what does that look like with my chips? That means I take my 2, positive 2, and I rewrite it as Plus negative three. <laughs> yeah? So this is my fancy zero. And I add fancy zero because my goal is to be able to remove three negative one chips, right? So I chose to add a positive three and a negative three so that I would have the negative three I need. Yeah? Because the next thing I want to do now is actually take away. So I'm going to take these, take them away. And what remains? is positive 5. So now we've figured out that 2 minus negative 3 is equal to positive 5. Cool? Hey, William, I post these online. <laughs> Just FYI, in case you haven't noticed. So in addition to the handouts and the quizzes and the quiz solutions, I also post the slides. There's lots of resources for you guys to use to study. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't know why that showed up twice. Do you want to practice some more? Or are you feeling good about it? Can you so practice doing H? So eleven minus negative four. So use the chips and then Capture what you did with the chips in, your, in a diagram. Should have picked a smaller number than 11. It's not... Oh, it's minus a negative four. Minus negative. Right. So you don't want you don't want these yet. <laughs> right? Like you want to be able to do what I just did, but right now what you have on your table is positive of minus have is positive of a plus negative four. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so you started with this, yeah. and then you added in this, right? Mm -hmm. So you're still representing 11. Yeah. And then subtraction means take these away. Uh -huh. Because of this part. Because this. because we're subtracting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And subtraction with chips means take away. And then I'm left with. And you're left with positive 15. Yeah. Cool. So now draw the diagram that will capture that. What am I looking at? Oh, I see. Okay. So you started, you started with this, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So that's box one in your diagram. And then box oh, two. Yeah. <laughs> box two is this, <laughs> yeah? yeah, where you added your fancy zero. Mm -hmm. And then box three is where you get rid of those. Okay. And what's left? Cool. So talk to me about, so box one? Yeah, 11. Cool. And then what did you have to do? Um, add, the, 
add four to make it zero. So you add all of those, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So your fancy zero. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's box two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then box three. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Show me the process. You have 11, and then I added four more okay. positives. Okay, so you started yeah. with, mm -hmm. with just this, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so that's box one. Then show me box two. Just that? With those. So you added in all eight chips mm -hmm. that represent your fancy zero. Then you take away that. So box three is just that. That's Beautiful. Good, good, good. So when you're drawing your diagrams, I want to see that progression, right? Of like, here's what we did, so I need to see step by step. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm eventually going to regret saying fancy zero. <laughs> it's everywhere. What would be the right word for it? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm technically okay with it saying adding fancy zero, but it would be nice if you could say add a fancy zero in the form of positive four plus negative four. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Cause, cause, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I see your diagram process? So yeah, so what I was suggesting is that you say add a fancy zero in the form of positive four plus negative four, just to like super clarify what's going on. Can I show this to the class? It's so beautiful. So just so you can see, your classmate wrote this beautifully, right? So we started with positive 11, and then we add a fancy zero. I would really appreciate it just so that, like, you leave no shadow of a doubt in my mind that you know exactly what you're doing. If instead of just saying add a fancy zero, you say add a fancy zero in the form of, in this case, positive 4 plus negative 4, right? So then you get this diagram where we've added in eight chips, but the value of those eight chips is zero. And we did that specifically so we could then take these four negative one chips and remove them. And what remains then is positive 15 chips. So then that means what we have shown is 11 minus negative four is equal to positive 15, right? Cool beans? Cool beans. Okay. Very, very pretty. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Just to remind you, though, right, um, there's always more than one way to do things. And so what we've been doing just now was using the takeaway model of subtraction. But there are other ways of thinking about subtraction, right? Namely, rethinking a subtraction problem as a missing add-end problem. Oh, we're going full circle, guys, right? This is like way at the beginning. Okay, so we've got problems here like negative 4 minus negative 2. And so instead of thinking of this as a takeaway, what I could do is think of this as being the same as Sorry, I should have erased. Okay, so what I could do, so negative 4 minus negative 2 is equal to box, right? But that's the same as saying negative 2 plus box equals 4. These are equivalents, right? 
Fact family? If you are, have, for instance, the chips out in front of you, then if you start with two negative chips, what would you need to put into, what else would you need to make it so that you have negative four? You have two chips, right? Oh, so that means that negative four minus negative two is negative two. Do you see it both ways? Okay, so what would it look like to do five minus negative one? So how do you rethink this problem instead of as a takeaway problem, how do you rethink it as a missing addend problem? So now we've got five minus negative one equals blank. So negative one plus blank is equal to five. All right, so how does this work with the chips? You start with, you start with the negative chip. So start with the red chip. And now what else do you need so that what's in front of you makes positive five. You need six positive one chips, right? So that means five minus negative one is positive six. So you've touched it, you've felt it. Could you do it with a number line? Right? So thinking about five minus negative one on the number line is the same thing as thinking about negative one plus blank equals five. So if you're at negative one, and you want to get to five on the number line, you go one, two, three, four, five, six to the right. That's the same as positive six. What view of integers is this? Is it as an opposite, as an, op as an additive inverse, or as a directed change? This is directed change. Yeah? Everything's connected. So exciting. Six minus one? Oh, that's no longer an. Okay. So the point of this was re. Was we re. re thought? <laughs> Right, so the whole thing is to get to an addition problem. Okay? Cool. Because addition with signed numbers feels very natural. Yeah? Like on a number line, you move to the right. If you're adding positive, you move to the left. If you're adding negative, with the chips, you just figure out how many, like you see it, right? Like combining chips is much easier than taking away chips, as we just saw, right? Because sometimes in order to take away, you have to add. <laughs> Whoa! Right? Okay. How are we doing? Good? Okay. I'm just going to throw this out there. The book puts a ton of blue box things in it that just kind of drive me crazy. If you want to read them, no, let me, how do I say this? <clears throat> you should read them and make sure that you understand what they <coughs> say. But please do not make flashcards to try to memorize them for the final. That would be a waste of your time. Because all these blue boxes do in this chapter is summarize things that you know. <laughs> right? Like when you add a positive number to a negative number, if the negative number is bigger in absolute value than the positive number, then you're going to get a negative number. So things like right, 8 plus negative 13 is going to be a negative number because the negative 13 in absolute value is bigger than the positive 8 was. Right? So it, it does a ton of those, and there's like lots of cases because you positives and negatives and all variations, and it's just it's a lot. 
to try to memorize formulaically. It's much better to just like read them, make sure you know what it says, and be like, yeah, I knew that already. <laughs> right? That's what I want you to do with that. OK. So we've done addition. We've done subtraction. What's next? Multiplication. Okay, so we already know how to think about multiplying a positive number times a positive number, right? In fact, we have multiple ways of thinking about that. But repeated addition, if we're thinking about using a chips model, is a good way, right? So if I want to do 3 times 2 using chips, what would I do with my chips? I'd have 3 sets of 2, right? Three twos. I do two plus two plus two. That's three times two. Okay. Can we do a positive times a negative? So can I do three times negative two using chips? Three times negative two? Can we still do repeated addition? So remember we just said three times two is as 2 plus 2 plus 2, right? So we thought of this as three copies of 2. So if I do 3 times, think of this. 3 copies of negative 2 added together, right? Number, yeah? But now, where it gets weird is if I have the negative number first. Because what would it mean to have negative copies? Well, that doesn't make sense, right? So if you want to use a chips model for multiplying, you have to be willing to be a little creative about it, OK? And so in particular, let's do, for instance, um, negative mm, 3 times positive 2, OK? So I want to make sense of negative 3 times positive 2 using chips. Well, at first, I've got nothing, right? Because like, I can't say I have some number of copies of anything. So I'm starting with a blank slate. But what I could do is instead of thinking, like I could maybe think of having this negative number of copies as a way of saying, well, instead of adding copies of something, maybe I'm taking away copies of something. Does that make sense? Do you buy it that that could be a way of thinking about this? So if this number, if the first number is negative, it would be telling you instead of adding copies of 2, we're going to subtract copies of 2. But then you should be asking yourself, from what? <laughs> Don't I need something to subtract from? And so then the idea is just like before um, where we had to add a fancy zero, we could start with a fancy zero. So in order to do negative 3 times positive 2, I'm going to start with a fancy zero. that I thought up by thinking about if these numbers were all positive, then I would have 6, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, so because this is a negative 3, I'm going to take away 3 copies of <coughs> from what I have here. So if I take away 1 copy, 2 copies, 3 copies, what's left? What do we have? Negative 6. Hey, it worked. Could we use that to do negative 3 times negative 2? What would that look like? So this was negative 3 times positive 2 here. Now I want to do negative 3 times negative 2. So how do I start? I start with a fancy zero in the form of positive 6 
plus negative 6. And what I'm being told to do is take away three copies of negative 2. So I take away one copy of negative 2, two copies of negative 2, three copies of negative 2. So when I take away three copies of negative 2, I'm left with positive 6. Hey. Pretty neat. So you can do it. It just takes a little bit of setting up, right? <clears throat> okay. So most of what we've been doing, maybe I should pause. Let me pause. Let you absorb for a second. So most of what we've been doing has been to go from, like, let me operate on these two numbers to get one number, right? So I'm going to add two numbers to get the sum. I'm going to subtract two numbers to get the difference. I'm going to multiply two numbers to get the product and divide two numbers to get the quotient, yeah? That's where our, our emphasis has lied. But remember, <coughs> these are all equations, which means you can always go in reverse. And so in particular, when we were doing like base 10 stuff, we took one number and we said, hey, I could de decompose the number like 57 into five tens plus seven ones, right? So we took a number and we decomposed it into a, a sum of other numbers, smaller numbers. Okay, well, you can also take a number like 24 and decompose it into a product of other numbers. We call that process factor. You guys have done it before. So show me what you remember. So here are three numbers. If I tell you to factor them, what does that mean? What does it mean to factor these numbers? Maybe let's start with 60. If I want to factor 60, what could I do? So I could think of 60. Yeah? Can I factor this further? Sure can. Because 6, I could think of as 2 times 3. 10? 2 times 5? So in particular, that means 60 is the same as 2 times 2, which I'll write as 2 squared, times 3, times 5. What about 126? Help me factor. There's an obvious one, yeah. This number is even, so we can pull out a 2. And then you get 63. Can you factor 63 further? 9 times 7, which is 3 times 3. So in particular, 126 is the same as 2 times 3 squared times 7. Let's come back to the 17. Can you factor 17? 1 times 17, that's not interesting, <laughs> so we'll leave it alone. Now, technically, you can write 17 as a product of two numbers. They just won't be whole numbers, right? So, like you, so side note, right, you can write 17 as a product. 17 is equal to 17 halves times 2, <laughs> for instance, right? But because 17 halves is not a whole number, we do not call this a factorization of the number 17. Okay? So the only factorization really is 1 and 17, but that's not interesting. In particular, one of the factors is 1 and the other is the number itself, which is exactly what we mean when we call them prime. 
The fact that we can write 60 and 126 as the product of other numbers besides 160 or 1 and 26 is what it means to call a number composite. Okay? Now, there's a lot of more interesting things to talk about here, in particular, like the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, but we'll get there. We'll talk about least common multiples, greatest common factors. We'll talk about divisibility rules, which are really fun. So we'll get there on Tuesday. Um, in the meantime, you guys have gift of numbers projects for me. You have lots and lots of stuff that you can start studying online. You can redo all of your homeworks for full credit if you want to. Maybe. I can put them there if they're not. I will look. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I will see you in a week. Oh, and I'm not, I'm not coming to campus tomorrow. We're not doing office hours tomorrow.